Hello everyone, I am Nathan P. Butler. This is my vlog, The Voice of Reason or Lack Thereof. This is one of two episodes of the vlog that will focus specifically on a new book I've just released, which is entitled, A Saga on Home Video, A Fan's Guide to U.S. Star Wars Home Video Releases. It was just released on Amazon and uh, CreateSpace. I would say use Amazon, it's the easiest way to get it, and you can get Prime Shipping, of course, to get it to you very quickly for free as far as shipping goes. And basically, yes, it is designed to look like an old school VHS tape. Just covered this in a book launch announcement video that was released yesterday. So for those of you who are looking more about the different chapters, what's in each, check that out here on the channel. It was put up on May 2nd, 2017, if you want to search by the date. But this vlog is specifically one focusing in on something I promised that I would do once the book was out, which is sort of, sort of, uh, sort of where did it come from? Behind the scenes, how is it developed type of thing. So if you're into that, if you've been watching from the Star Wars Home Video Library, you may find this particularly interesting. On the other hand, if you're not really into this book or Star Wars Home Video, you're probably going to want to skip this episode because there's not going to be a whole lot in here for you. Uh, the next episode we're going to look at is the question of the future of this publication and things of its type in relation to projects um, from my side of things. First off, though, I do want to answer a very common question that I'm getting about the book. Uh, or a couple of common questions. One, will there be an ebook version? As of right now, the answer is no. You can put anything that's gone through CreateSpace through a Kindle conversion process. It doesn't necessarily work out very well. This book is extremely heavy on pictures. Uh, it averages more than one picture per page because there are over 300 pictures, around like 320, 340 or something like that. And it's all told about, I think it's 294 pages if you count all the front matter and everything put together here. And the reason why I say no is because the conversion process isn't very straightforward. It's not good to do automatically if you have a very image heavy book. For instance, you got something like this where you've got uh, the Rogue One lithograph cover from Disney Store, the symbol that's on the lithograph so you know what to look for to make sure they're genuine, and then the four lithographs. So you got four different images here. One, two, three, four. And they're set up in here to make it look right and be nicely aligned right beside each other without having to worry about shifts as the pages change and stuff like that. They're set up basically in a table. One row being the images, one row being the uh, caption, then a blank row, images row, caption row, and so on. Well, you try to put that through the conversion process and the table that is disappeared in here, all the lines are gone in here, so it's just the images and their captions that looks really nice, they pop back and yes, you wind up seeing all of them in the book, not to mention the fact that there's other formatting things that need to be done. So at the moment, I would say no, it's probably not going to happen. If it does, if at some point I'm able to put out the book as a Kindle version, I am going to do that thing called, I believe it's called Paper Match or Page Match. The thing basically that uh, Amazon does that allows you basically to have it so that somebody who has bought a physical copy of a book from them who then tries to buy the Kindle copy of a book from them, would be able to basically get the Kindle copy for a deep, deep discount because they've already picked up the book in another way. I actually did that with some of uh, the uh, Saga of Shadows books from Kevin J. Anderson relatively recently. It's kind of a cool thing that Amazon's been doing that really hasn't got a lot of hype, even though it probably should have. But for now, print is going to be your way to do it. Uh, can I get this anywhere other than Amazon? Yes, but it may take a little while. From what I understand, uh, with all the different distribution channels that I've selected through the publishing process through Create Space, they will eventually be able to order this within standard bookstores like, say, Barnes & Noble. But that process appears to be something that could take up to six to eight weeks in order to make something available. So if you want it anytime sooner than that and just deliver it straight to your door, the much, much easier way to do it is simply to hop on Amazon, grab it from there. Again, a saga on home video is just the title to search for. You'll find it very quickly. The other question I keep getting is, how can I get myself a signed copy of this? I really want to get this, but I want to get it signed because I've been following the YouTube channel for so long. A um, couple of ways that we can do that. One is for you to reach out to me and for us to arrange something where you send me your copy along with basically a bubble mailer or something inside that's already got your address on it to send it back and all the postage already paid on it. So all I got to do is sign it, slip it in that envelope and send it back to you. The old uh, SASE, self-addressed stamped envelope concept. The other option in this day and age would also be that you could say, okay, let me set something up with you and I'll PayPal you some money. Uh, right now it's tended to be 20 bucks is what we're thinking is probably the, the right amount for that. Um, but while well, PayPal you some money and then what you can do, Nathan, is you just order a copy and have it sent to you and then sign it and then send it to me. So basically I could order 
get it off of Amazon, have it sent to me, sign that copy, mail it to you. All I would basically need is enough money to cover buying the book, having it shipped to me, and shipping it back out to you, which again, right now we're thinking is about $20. It hasn't been done yet. We're in the process of it. I have the first copies to do that kind of thing being sent to me. So that may change uh, once we see what the actual shipping costs wind up being to send it back out to people. Uh, if you want to pursue either of those options, that's great. You can email me directly at Nathan at StarWarsFanWorks.com. If you do that, make sure that you put signed copy in the subject line. You just let me know in the body that you're inquiring about uh, options for being able to get a signed copy. The reason I say make sure signed copy is in the subject line is because that email address is one that's been public knowledge and put up on the websites and everything since it really kicked off back in 2003. So you would not believe the sheer amount of spam it gets every day. Give you a hint, it's in the multiple hundreds every single day. I need to be able to spot your email as it comes in so I know that it's not junk. So that said, what about the making of and the background of this book? Where did it come from? Well, in a sense, it's been kind of building up for a while in terms of the confidence to be able to do this and the background to be able to put together a book. My first published writing, as many of you already know, was a fortuitous thing. I'd been doing my podcast for a while or for a couple of years at least at that point, Chrono Radio at the time. I've been doing my Star Wars Timeline project now known as the Star Wars Timeline Gold, the most comprehensive Star Wars chronology available anywhere now, which back then was just one among many. I've been doing that for about uh, six-ish years or so at that point, six or seven years. And I have been putting together audio dramas, uh, Star Wars fan-made audio dramas, including the first one ever released online, Second Strike. This is all around like 2002, 2003-ish. As we get towards 2004, Jeremy Barlow had the job at Dark Horse of basically going in and retooling and in some sense relaunching Star Wars Tales for issues 21 to 24 into a new format. This lifted the restrictions briefly of this idea that to write for Star Wars, not only do you have to be invited to the party, which it was still true, but also that you had to have established yourself with previous professional works before you'd even have a chance of being invited to the party. Now he was free to bring in people who had Star Wars knowledge, who could write, who had a passion for it and understood the chronology without necessarily needing that background information about some kind of previous publishing history for themselves. What that meant was that my first professional story of any kind, uh, my first professional writing of any kind, was for Star Wars Tales. Uh, it was a story called Equals and Opposites in issue number 21, which had an art cover and a, uh, a photo cover, a photoshopped cover, available for it. It eventually wound up in the pages of Star Wars Tales Volume 6 from Dark Horse Comics, and a few years later wound up having a comic pack come out from Hasbro that included a couple of figures and just that story rather than the story and multiple other tales, as was the case with the others. But doing that, having that sort of professional nod, and having people give good feedback on that, saying they enjoyed the story, gave me essentially the confidence to say, you know what, maybe, just maybe, people might actually like to read some other stuff that I write. I had done some writing before, but most of what I wrote was either for personal use, uh, for academic use, like writing alternate endings to stories for literature classes and stuff like that, like There Will Come Soft Rains by Ray Bradbury. Um, I think it's Bradbury. Uh, or it was basically stuff that I would start and never finish, never finish writing. And this gave me the, the impetus to actually start writing something that I felt passionate about and actually get it done. Now, that book that I wound up writing, that novella, was known as Echoes. It's not available anymore, but it was available. It's sort of a 6x9 larger copy, the same size as what uh, a Saga on Home Video is, except significantly thinner in terms of page count. I put out sort of a smaller pocket-sized one that at first I played around with when it came for where to put a title or where to put the author's name, which was Echoes, an original novel by Nathan P. Butler. But then eventually, I settled on a pocket size of this. Now, you notice I said I settled on because this was my first venture in 2006 into self-publishing anything. I wasn't going to look for some kind of publishing group to do it. I just wanted to put it out there and see if people would like it. In fact, I put these out for no profit whatsoever, just the cost of printing at the time. And because I wasn't doing it to make profit, I also did an audio version produced by me that was done as a podcast, so-called Podio Book, uh, that was available essentially as a downloadable audiobook version of it. It's not available anymore. I look back on it as not being quite where I would have wanted it to be from a writing style uh, and level standpoint, but it was my first opportunity to do any kind of self-publishing. You had to set up your own interior. You had to make sure you had all of your you know, copyright information and all that kind of stuff. And unless you wanted to pay a ton of money, 
you had to create your own cover. I did this through Lulu.com. So it was my first chance of saying, okay, well, how do I get a cover that I can use for this? And what I wound up using was a picture my own father took on a trip to Washington, D.C., which I then cropped and turned into grayscale to get this Capitol building as the background. I then used Photoshop to create uh, the rest of the cover art here. So I had a chance to experiment with it, but that was through a site called Lulu.com. Still exists, just not what I'm using because CreateSpace is a much more uh, accessible, I want to say accessible, it's much more accessible to buyers than Lulu is. Lulu is a little tougher to get your book to people, whereas Amazon obviously is a massive storefront that's really easy for most people to access and CreateSpace distributes directly through there. I got enough of a positive response from that to say, you know what, I got another idea. I want to go kind of all out with this and have an actual full-length novel with a lot of historical ties, a lot more depth than the novella Echoes had ever been. So three years later in 2009, I again did some self-publishing and self-published a book called Greater Good. as a sci-fi time travel and telepaths thing, basically uh, sort of Terminator with a twist, as in you think it's the Terminator tropes and it turns out not so much, not really. Now, again playing around with Lulu. This time I experimented with a hardback edition and with a paperback edition, this time using uh, an image that is uh, royalty-free because it's uh, provided through NASA. So, again, had a chance to kind of figure out, you know, different elements of the publishing aspect of it, the self-publishing side of things, cover generation, and all that kind of stuff, all, again, through Lulu.com at the time. But that was self-publishing. And I hadn't had a chance to really do anything at that point that had been nonfiction, nor had I done anything professionally for a, some type of license thing or through an actual publisher aside from self-publishing since back in 2004. But that started to change. My Star Wars fandom projects and my work with things like producing Greater Good, a full-length novel through self-publishing, got the attention of Josh Radke and Grail Quest Books. And they offered me another opportunity to write something that it was a licensed work based on a previously existing franchise as a professional publication uh, through an actual publisher. This is something of me basically saying, huh, so apparently my stick to itness with the self-publishing has actually helped garner some attention, though probably a lot of it was that I'd written for Star Wars Tales, to be able to have another opportunity laid in front of me. This is fantastic. And I jumped do it into it with gusto, so to speak, and in, gosh, let's see, in, I want to say it was 2010, I believe it was, we put out my first novella for Wars the Battle of Foes, based on the Wars franchise from Decipher Inc., the uh, old CCG, the card game that they had out there that followed much of the mechanics of the Star Wars CCG after Decipher lost the Star Wars license uh, to Wizards of the Coast. We had an illustrated novella edition of it at first, and it was released as an ebook, and then eventually, the first three ebooks of this long series. It was eventually planned to be nine different novellas, three from each of the three main factions of wars. I was doing the Earther side, uh, at least the first two of the Earther side novellas. The first of the three factions, Earther, Ganjin, or Mars, and Mavericks, which are like the space pirates, got collected into this. Wars the Battle of Phobos, Preludes from Grail Quest Book, which was later re-released with a more dynamic cover as this. Then... That was uh, released in 2011. In 2012, I had the opportunity to work a couple of times with Grail Quest Books as we put out the second of my Wars novellas entitled On Red Soil, which was available as an ebook, and then collected into Wars Volume 2, along with the Gonjin and Maverick Volume 2s, known as Stretti. But at the same time, I was working on revising Greater Good. There was a question of, well, would you like to take this book that you're so proud of that you think is one of your best works, would you like to perhaps professionally publish it rather than just keeping it out there as a self-published item or as a patio book? There's a patio book of that one also. So after some revising and expanding and adding a new afterword and some new inserts uh, from the manifesto of the villain, Grail Quest Books published my sci-fi, time travel, and telepaths novel, Greater Good, as a professional edition. Uh, Greater Good revised and expanded. So I had the opportunity to go through some work for a giant licensee-type publisher like Dark Horse Comics in the comic book realm. And in prose fiction, I had a chance to do some self-publishing and to work with a smaller publisher on both a licensed work and an original work at that point. But still nothing non-fiction. At that point, the closest I had come to non-fiction was writing an article for Jeffrey Todd Carlton's Star Wars Super Collector's Wishbook 4th Edition about chronology that was in the back of this 
collecting guide. I'd also assisted a little bit more within the Star Wars realm doing dated battle maps for the Essential Atlas, where I put together the dates, and then they added them to the map so that it could be more like a historical record. But still, not really in the realm of non-fiction, because even when I'm talking about a chronology of Star Wars books and telling people what order to check them out in, that's still really focusing on the fictional universe of Star Wars, not really looking at it from an above, you know, kind of 30,000 feet level, looking down on it as a franchise, as pop culture. It was in that late 2014, early 2015 type of time period here where I finally got the opportunity for several different options, uh, several different opportunities in rapid succession to do something nonfiction about that saga that I love so much, Star Wars. The first opportunity came when I was recommended to write an article about the upcoming The Force Awakens for Movie Magic Magazine and one of their issues counting down to the film. Uh, it was a paid gig. It was something that was talking about Star Wars rather than being sort of in the Star Wars universe or anything like that, like my Star Wars chronology project, the Star Wars Timeline Gold, had been. It gave me a chance to sort of explore thinking critically and talking critically about Star Wars in print rather than on podcasts and the like. And right around the same time, the same person who I believe had recommended me at the time, Rich Handley, who's done all kinds of books out there like uh, uh, Unofficial Guides to... A Planet of the Apes, lots of those unofficial guides to a Back to the Future and all kinds of stuff like that uh, through his publishing company and various others, uh, came and said, hey, how would you like to submit essays to a series of essay collections that I'm doing about Star Wars uh, to kind of celebrate the saga as it's heading toward its 40th anniversary and the new films and whatnot? I said yes and wound up actually writing essays for all three of the three volumes, the first two of which are out, the third of which is coming later this year. So I had a chance to write about the first season of Rebels for a long time ago, exploring the Star Wars cinematic universe. I had a chance to write about all the Marvel Comics stuff from the 70s and 80s leading up to and then through the Empire Strikes Back comic adaptation in a galaxy far, far away, exploring Star Wars comics. And then the upcoming A More Civilized Age, I will have an article that's actually the afterword for the entire series, focusing in on sort of what Star Wars does that brings us together and the idea of criticism not necessarily being a bad thing uh, that'll be in that last volume that's mostly about Star Wars novels. But that was my opportunity. That's what kind of kicked things off for me saying, huh, here's a guy who, Rich, who in doing a lot of his different works, a Watchmen guide and things like that, has been able to sort of figure out this idea where the line is between collecting guides and criticism and uh, guidebooks in general uh, over fictional topics and editorializing and so forth is within the confines of what's referred to as fair use law. So if you wanted to do a Star Wars novel, can't do it, copyright protects that universe as Lucasfilms, Disney's, and so on. Uh, Star Wars comic, no, can't do that either. Anything that's fictional within the universe, you can't do unless it's fan fiction or something that's out there that you're putting online for free, as soon as you start making any money off of it, as soon as you start publishing it, then you have crossed a copyright line. But fair use laws are designed to allow things like reviews, commentaries, critical eyes on art, and so forth, and things like that. And that is where books like these come in, because they're not trying to tell a Star Wars story. They're taking a pop culture historical look back on it and saying what was good, what was bad, taking a critical eye telling a history of what's going on and so forth, uh, doing it in a scholarly way, in a way that fits within fair use, hopefully educates the audience, but expresses that shared love of this saga. Um, it was something that inspired me because I thought, wow, I hadn't really thought about that before. I knew those kinds of guides were out there, but Rich has done a lot of these for a lot of different projects, for a lot of different uh, franchises, which made me think, maybe it's something I should think about. People have been asking me for years to publish my Star Wars timeline project. I said, no, that's way too close to producing something that would basically be designed as, that some could see as a replacement for actually reading the books. If you could get that and read summaries of them and things like that, I don't want to push that because that then threads over the line from fair use commentary into something else that's legally questionable. But something that worked like a history, like a commentary, like a collecting guide, like those many ones from Jeffrey Todd Carlton. This is the second edition. I showed you the fourth edition a moment ago. Uh, that type of thing is in the ballpark of fair use. But really, I didn't think for years that I would ever have something to say in that type of vein. 
But what had happened was that since 2013, I had started becoming a voracious collector of Star Wars home video releases. I started with a handful that I thought was a lot at the time, got a few more, got a few more, and it just built and built and built. And over the years, people kept saying, you ought to write a book about this stuff. You're really knowledgeable about it. You've done your research, etc., etc." And that was lovely and all, except I didn't have really a complete collection. I knew there was still stuff I was trying to find. I was like, no, I don't think I'm there yet. No, I don't think I'm there yet. No, I don't think I'm there yet. Until inspired by this, I started thinking, well, you know, my collection for U.S. releases at least is getting pretty much filled out. Maybe I do have something to offer in that regard. And that sparked the idea of maybe I should try to put out a book on that subject. Because it turns out there really isn't anything else like that out there. There's tons of Star Wars collecting guides. And a lot of the collecting guides include little sections on home video, but it's a picture and a product name and that's it. Or a picture and a product name and a price at the time. That doesn't do you any good if you want to know the history of how it developed. Uh, there's no narrative to something like that. And I really like the idea of historical narratives on pop culture and how different pop culture franchises, product lines and such, evolved over time. So I thought, maybe this is something I should actually try. The big downside, though, was that I didn't want to spend the time to shop it around to publishers and such. And I'd had some issues previously because... Again, there's a lot of different ways that publishers get get things out there. You might be paid up front and maybe get royalties later. Or you get paid up front and you get royalties later if it sells over a certain amount that is unlikely. Or it might be you don't get paid at all up front and then eventually you'll get paid if royalties reach a certain amount or whatever. So I found that with most of the works that I had done, other than being paid up front for writing, there really weren't a lot of royalties or anything like that in play. So it was sort of a you got paid once, and the product is still out there being sold, but you're not seeing anything else come in. So the only group or the only publisher that I actually turned to and said, would you be interested in this, was Rich Handley uh, and his Hasseline, I believe is how you say it, books, uh, to see if he'd be interested to put it alongside the product line with things like uh, those books from Sequan or uh, books that he has, like uh, the Back to the Future books and so on. But they're overloaded with projects at the time. It wasn't going to be something that was feasible, which meant if I was going to do it, be self-published or nothing. And again, having had that experience doing that with Echoes and Greater Good, I decided I think I'll try to do it, but I need to do it through Create Space, something that actually has a much broader audience to be able to be on Amazon that is a much faster process for people. Lots of people have the Amazon Prime shipping and such, something that really just makes it really user-friendly or buyer-friendly, consumer-friendly to get this book. I don't want to make it and put it out there and then have nobody actually know where to find it and have nobody actually reading it, because that would be a waste of time, even though it would be an interesting process of creation and research to actually put something like that together. Well, I had never used Create Space before, but thankfully, a friend of mine had. You see, when I was writing for Wars, I made contact with one of the biggest Wars fans that I know, Jim Wilder, or James Robert Cruz Wilder, who now is also the creator of a sci-fi universe through a book series he's released through Create Space, called 10,000 Dawns. Uh, this is the initial book in the series, and I had a chance to actually write recently a couple of short stories, a short transition story and a longer uh, regular-sized short story, to be in his upcoming 10,000 Dawns book entitled Poor Man's Iliad. But he had used Create Space, which meant that he understood the formatting, the cover design, uh, what type of template you need to use, what type of margins, all that kind of technical stuff on how to make a book work. And I knew that in looking at his book, he had added artwork in it, which meant that if he knew how to add artwork, maybe he could give me some tips on how to make sure to correctly add in those pictures that I wanted to add, because I wasn't going to do a product listing book, but I was going to do a history of Star Wars home video, and I've got all the stuff on my shelves. I'm absolutely going to fill that thing with pictures to act as a good guide, not just in words, but visually. So with his assistance, it began. Uh, he passed me along the 6x9 formatted template that you can get for Create Space, uh, which does everything really formatting-wise as far as just some of the general formatting, except for setting you up with your cover. The cover is a separate beast and kind of a pain in the butt to actually put together unless you want to pay somebody to do it. And that's where the work began on a saga on home video. Uh, basically, I started writing during, I believe it was the uh, Christmas break, the break between semesters of this current school year. So I started writing in uh, late December of 2016. 
uh, and continue writing into early 2017, at least initially, and basically had the broad outlines of trying to work my way through the saga. There were a lot of holes in what I was writing at the time. Uh, there were a lot of things I would want to add, and I didn't have any pictures added, at least initially, but I was working on getting a narrative going. How was I going to be able to tell this as a history and keep it interesting, while at the same time being very extensive in my coverage, not skipping over a whole bunch of releases because, well, let's get to something that everybody knows about. Like, let's skip over all the mid-1980s releases because everybody knows about, you know, see it again for the first time in the special editions. No, I wanted to cover all of it, which meant that I needed to be able to create something that was more narrative-driven and more uh, comparison-driven and such over time than just something that would bounce around or be very clinical in its language. Something that introduced a little bit of humor and lots of side commentary. You know me on these things. I'll be talking about something and then make some kind of a side that's kind of a goopy thing or might be a joke and whatnot. That is no exception in the book itself. There are about 120-some-odd footnotes in the book most of which add a little bit more information, and a substantial number of which uh, are humorous in some form or another, such as my, my complete disdain for uh, Snips and Sky Guy as nicknames. It, it lists a couple of args throughout the book. Once I started writing, I knew I needed to figure out pictures. And I look at something, again, like the Super Collector's Wish Book, which I like as a guide that has tons of product information and tons of pictures in it. And I sit back wondering, okay, in order to do this, how do I make sure that while I know that the text is all going to be perfectly fine legally, how do I make sure the pictures are? Because you could make the argument that if you scan an item's cover and put it in the book, that's essentially hijacking that artwork. Uh, it's questionable on some legal levels. I didn't want to put myself in that position. I wanted to make sure that if I was going to show product images, they were my product images. I took the pictures, meaning I own the copyright to them, which meant breaking out the iPhone. I have a couple of uh, tables set up in our front room. Uh, this very much, uh, it's, it, you've seen them plenty of times before if you watch this channel. It's just usually you see a uh, Star Wars playmat for Fantasy Flight Games laying on there because that's where I do the reviews of things like the Fantasy Flight Games X-Wing miniatures and uh, the cards that come out for the LCG and stuff like that. For From the Star Wars Home Video Library, that's where I record uh, the little timeline thing of the different releases that comes at the end of that playlist. So I had a place to take pictures. It was just a question of getting the pictures taken. And I decided to basically just go in big chunks. It's a marathon days where day after day, for hours at a time, I was pulling stuff off the shelves in big groups, just taking them in there, laying them out, taking pictures, taking pictures, taking pictures, taking pictures. Is there glare on that one? No good. Oh, do I need to move the table because there's glare? Fine. Pictures, 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 pictures. Um, for days, days, taking pictures and trying to make sure I was showing things the way that I expected to want to show them in the book. For example, not just showing the cover of a season set of Clone Wars, I took them out so you could see the slip cover and the cover and all the discs all at once and went ahead and in some cases put uh, uh, the DVD version, the Blu-ray version, both in the same picture as an automatic comparison. Uh, look for things that needed to be compared in, in closer view, like the cover of certain packages, uh, things that were being specifically called out that I wanted to make sure to see, like comparison of disc labels between the first couple of releases of the original trilogy on DVD and the latter couple of releases of that. Basically just taking pictures of everything. Uh, and trying to stay away from things that wouldn't really work, though, at the same time as art. Like, for instance, you won't see comparisons of labels of the laser discs because when taking the pictures, it's very hard to get that to come out right without a lot of weirdness around the edges of it when you try to take a square or rectangular picture of the circular label. Uh, much of the material around it is reflected right back at you. Uh, so in those cases, for instance, laser discs focusing on the packaging and whatnot, so it's easier to tell when you're trying to buy those things uh, what to be looking for. With the pictures, the next consideration was, do I do like the Super Collector's Wish Book, and do I do it all in color? And very quickly, the answer was no, because I don't want a book through CreateSpace that's going to cost people an arm and a leg. Uh, as soon as you start making it a color book, the prices for production and the prices to buy a book start skyrocketing. So I stuck with the idea of it being sort of more of a historical type thing, uh, taking the approach very much of those books from Sequart, like a long time ago, with the essay collection and such, and going with grayscale. So the next step was to take every single image that I had taken, crop them down to just the product itself, 
and switch it to grayscale, but leave it in the same format otherwise that it was on the phone, so 300 dpi and that sort of thing. So they could easily be inserted into the file in Microsoft Word that was growing very steadily in file size to a ridiculous, ridiculous uh, degree. Eventually then, I had to insert them in, and I decided to use tables to do it, as I mentioned before, so you can have everything nicely lined up with the text, so you can have comparisons side by side that actually line up very well, and so that in putting them in, I wasn't running into issues when I also had footnotes on the same pages. Um, that took a matter of months. I printed out the book uh, multiple times and did a full run-through copy editing, because I've done copy editing of, of plenty of things previously, so I've had a chance to go through and make sure that everything looks right, sounds right, redundant words are taken away, phrasing is tweaked, uh, looking for little errors and things like that, making sure that the order of things makes sense, all those types of things, um, to finally get to a point where it looked like it was pretty much ready to go. Only by then, we had reached March, basically, and there's a little bit of work left to be done, but of course, March 2017 meant that we were less than a month away from having a home video release of Rogue One, which sort of brought me to a halt. And I realized I want to make sure that this is as comprehensive as it could possibly be as of the time of release, which means I need to wait for Rogue One. If I'm going to put this out, say, in May to celebrate the 40th anniversary of A New Hope, that's wonderful and all, except it wouldn't make sense to put it out in May if it doesn't have Rogue One in it because it's being released in April, and then later in April in the UK, and so on and so on. So, at that point, it was a matter sort of of waiting, tweaking things, going back and adding sidebars in where I thought it was interesting to add a few more sidebars, adding in a few more product images. Since I had the time to actually do it, I didn't feel rushed or anything. Uh, there was actually a point at which I was planning on having it ready by Star Wars Celebration, because I was going to Star Wars Celebration. We had proposed the idea of having a Star Wars home video collecting panel on the collecting track. And if they had said yes, I would have made sure to have the book ready by then, which would have meant no Rogue One coverage, so that I could show it there at the panel and perhaps even sell copies while there. Um, thankfully, I guess it worked out well because the panel didn't get approved, which meant that I had at least until May uh, to keep up with getting everything ready, which meant plenty of time to get all the Rogue One stuff in there. Actually, the last products added were the Rogue One releases from the UK uh, that arrived right before the final revision that I was making to the book. Um, after that, it's a matter of making sure that the cover was ready. And the cover, if you go through Create Space, you're going to make your own cover. It's kind of an interesting process. One, you need to make sure that you just have the ability to make something in some type of photo editing program. I use Photoshop. I do that whole paid subscription thing every month, 10 bucks, uh, to have access to Photoshop constantly, consistently. And what I did with that, basically, I figured out early on I wanted it to look like a VHS tape. So you got your VHS tape kind of look here, same thing on the back. You got that little side with the label type of thing going on. But what you basically have to do is it'll tell you, okay, you're making a six by nine, excuse me, a six by nine book. Well, that's lovely and all. Problem is, you don't know how big your spine's going to be. So it'll tell you, okay, it needs to be nine inches tall and this little amount of bleed on either edge to make sure that it does cover the entire cover. Fantastic. Now is the tricky part. You need this much for your front and your back and your bleed, but as far as the spine goes to know how much to allot for that in your one image that's a wraparound cover image, um, you're going to have to take this very, very small number times the exact number of pages to figure out exactly how wide your spine needs to be so you know how wide your image for your cover needs to be. Well, that meant that I couldn't actually finish the cover entirely until I knew exactly how many pages there were which meant I had to wait until I was writing, and then during the entire revision process, as I was submitting files and getting them ready through Create Space to make sure that we had a good copy that was ready to go, I had to make sure that any changes and tweaks that I made didn't change the page count. Because if that happened, it would change the size, and I would have to redo my cover image, albeit usually just expanding the canvas and expanding out the edges um, based on the way that I designed the spine to have something running down the center and an indeterminate amount of space on either side of it, uh, the top or bottom, left or right, depending on which way you're looking at the thing. Once that was pretty much done, once I felt like the files are ready to go, that's when I went to create space, and the process basically is that you fill out some information, uh, you give them some tax details, because yes, this is tax like any other income, um, and you submit your files, and that meant submitting an image file for the cover, which actually I believe I had to turn into a PDF at one point, 
uh, you insert your image file for your cover, and you insert your uh, your body file. And what it does is they'll go through and process the body file. Even if it's perfectly formatted and has used their template, they will then go in and kind of tweak it as it goes through that process to get ready, which means that some of the stuff you've aligned may not align exactly the same. It may not look exactly like when you were putting it together in the template, which is incredibly, incredibly frustrating. Um, the idea then being that as the author, then it's your job to essentially proof it, and you can proof it online, or you can proof it as a physical copy. So I went ahead and ordered a physical copy thinking, I'm good, it's all set, all I gotta do is look at this, it'll be good, thumbs up, boom, it's out there, we're done. But not so much. I hadn't realized that the formatting process would make it look at all different than the template. Because it's a freaking create space template. It's supposed to be what your book's going to look like. But it did. And there was an issue that arose in the first proof. This here is actually that first proof copy that I ordered. And you'll see the issue as soon as you take a look at the footnotes. The pictures came out fine. The sidebars came out fine. The text came out fine. Looked great until I looked and some of the footnotes did this crap. What you're seeing here is the last line of text of the page. The THX remastering process meant that these were entirely new. Goes on to the other page. And then a footnote underneath it. Uh, footnote 23. The 20th Century Fox 75th Anniversary Collection is actually a tiny bit heavier, but it isn't a Star Wars release per se, just a product that happens to include a Star Wars DVD. And uh, footnote 24. It was the 1990s. Of course it was Velcro. Yeah, you had to be there. Uh, the problem was that above every footnote, there's a horizontal line to separate it from the body text and make it look nice. But you notice what happened. The line separating the footnote from the text actually ran into and through some of the text. And as I flipped through, most of them looked fine. But every so often, I run into them again running through the freaking text. So the footnotes, even though they were formatted correctly in the template, looked fine didn't work when actually run through the process and put through the printing process of create space, which meant sort of back to the drawing board. So I went back to the file, uh, tried tweaking it a little bit, uploaded it again. Didn't order a physical proof because now I was pissed off that I'd ordered a physical proof and thought I was done, and it turns out there was an issue with it, and used the digital proofing where you can look at it online and see how the pages are going to be laid out, which I should have done in the first place, um, that was overzealous, to see if it looked fine. Checked that. Ah, crap, this one doesn't work. Upload. Ah, crap, upload. Eventually wound up with multiple uploads, re-uploads of the body of it, till finally it looked like it was good to go from what I could tell, and I ordered a second proof copy. So I got it back, you know, got the new proof, took a look. Yeah, yeah. Looks good with the format of those footnotes and everything. Basically, pro tip, if you're trying to use Create Space on something, using their regular 6x9 template and you're using footnotes, Go into the uh, the uh, draft view as opposed to the uh, uh, view as it would be printed. Uh, when you do that, have it turn on footnotes down at the bottom and a little window, and then change your little selector down there to show you what the divider lines look like for your footnotes and add a return, a blank line, above your footnote line so that every single time it inserts a footnote, it makes sure there's space with your text. It is going to add a little bit of length. Thankfully, there was some wiggle room with the length, so it didn't wind up changing the page count when I did that. It did wind up shifting some of my pages, which meant that I had to go in and make sure that the images were still matched up with their captions and all that kind of crap. But I thought, ha ha, finally, now I'm done. No. And I realized it about five minutes after I ordered my second proof copy when I went to take a shower, because... It's like, uh, it's like Dana Carvey says in Opportunity Knox. Most of life's major decisions aren't made in the board room. They're made in the bathroom. And sure enough, my big realization while I was in the bathroom taking a shower was, wait, when I proofed that thing, did I do what I did for the timeline? Oh, crap. I don't think that I did. Now, it must be saying, well, what does he mean by do what he did for the timeline? See, when I work on the Star Wars timeline gold, and I use the same process when writing a saga on home video, there'll be times where I'm not sure about a name, or not sure about a word, or it might be like I'm writing a, chat, a, a summary of a piece of a book where a character hasn't been named yet, but I know that we get their first name later, and all we've seen is like a last name, and I want to make sure the first name's there. 
So what do I do as a placeholder? Either ASDF or question mark, question mark. So that it'd be caught by a spell checker. And then I could go in and find them again with a quick edit find because I know that I'm not going to find other things purposely as ASDF or question mark, question mark. Well, think about it was that in this newest version of Microsoft Word, it wasn't catching double question marks as something that was wrong. That was a placeholder for me, but it wasn't being caught by spell and grammar check. And instead, I had to spot those by eye and do an edit find to find them and make sure that they were all replaced with the actual words that I wanted to be there. And I hadn't done that. That's usually one of the last things I do for my Star Wars Timeline Gold before release, double check to make sure those are all taken care of. This time, I just it totally slipped my mind to do that for this book because I'd forgotten that I would even used placeholders like that because I figured those were all dealt with way, way, way long ago. And it turned out it was in one of the last things that I wrote. On page 141, actually 140 through 142, I believe. Yes, 140 to one. Oh, excuse me, 140 to the beginning of 143. I have a sidebar, meanwhile in the United Kingdom, looking at Rogue One releases from the UK. The last things I got to be able to actually put into the book. And sure enough, there's an image up here of the different covers. And it says, Rogue One UK releases, clockwise from top left. Regular with limited edition sleeve, Zavi exclusive steelbook, Rogue One Junior novelization, bonus with purchase at double question marks, DVD only, multi-format, blah, blah, blah. I hadn't known when I initially took the picture or I hadn't gone back and looked at my emails to see where Julian Smith had told me that it was Sainsbury's where he was able to get that junior novelization free when he got the copies of Rogue One for me uh, before sending them out. So I put in a double question mark and I put a double question mark in in the text where that word was needed. Problem was when I went in and filled in Sainsbury's in the text, I never did it for the caption. So because of one placeholder double question mark, I had to fix it and upload it again, wait for it to be approved by CreateSpace again, and order another proof copy to make sure that it looked right after doing a check digitally. <sighs> that one finally arrived on May 2nd, the date of release, and it actually gave me pause briefly, because when it showed up, I noticed something was weird with it. That third proof copy. Notice here, probably... The little label-looking thing, as if on a VHS, that has the title on it, just barely wrapped onto the front, and the back edge had gray, as opposed to it being confined to the side entirely, and the back edge being black. In the printing process, there was some kind of printing error that shifted the artwork a tiny bit because of a printer misalignment, I guess, that wound up causing this to have an error to its cover. It's apparently very rare, but it does sometimes happen with uh, things that are print-on-demand like Create Space. So I got it, freaked out, got frustrated, thankfully had a chance to talk to James and said, is this normal? I expected this to be kind of a normal thing. It might happen, you know, one out of a hundred times, two hundred times, whatever. He's like, yeah, yeah, it happens. I mean, it has nothing to do with your cover. Your cover's formatted fine. You saw that on the other copies. It's just that on that one copy, something was misaligned when they were producing it. At which point, I know it was finally good to go, and I gave the okay for Create Space to make it available. And when you do that, it says it'll be available on Create Space immediately, and it'll take probably up to two to three days to make sure that it's available then on Amazon. Check back later. Well, I checked later in the day, and it was already immediately available for purchase on Amazon. So that whole it'll take a couple days thing doesn't always necessarily apply. There are other channels. You can choose which channels you want to make it available through, one of which is just regular bookstores and other online booksellers. But those, for every time you do an update or put out something new, will take about six to eight weeks to actually make them available to those outlets, apparently, based on what it says on CreateSpace. So it was a, an interesting process, lots of photo taking. Uh, thankfully, not a lot of research at the time. I had already done the research, so a lot of this I knew. It was more looking for specifics, like what date did something happen? Like what date did this company turn into this company or this brand turn into this brand? Uh, doing some measuring, like exactly what are the measurements of, say, the lithographs from Disney Store versus the lithographs in the big sleeve edition kind of stuff, uh, or the art prints, as they call them. Um, and then making sure that everything was just lined up from a format standpoint. I am very meticulous when it comes to that, very anal retentive when it comes to that. Um, so as many times as I did pass-throughs of it and design pass-throughs, 
it should be in really nice shape now, uh, now that it's been made available. I'm very proud of this. Um, it's, I think, going to be, at least for now, sort of a definitive work on this subject of Star Wars home video. But again, it's really the only one out there. It's kind of like saying, hey, you are my favorite daughter. You're my only daughter, but you're totally my favorite. Well, I'm sure this will be everybody's favorite guide to Star Wars home video for a while, because it's the, as far as I know, only one out there for Star Wars home video that takes this type of approach. But that's the story. A lot of build-up to eventually get me to the point where I felt like this is something I could even do at all, thanks in a lot of ways to the self-publishing I had done before that got a positive reception, uh, just getting into writing it all, thanks in a lot of ways uh, to Jeremy Barlow and my work with Rich Handley and Movie Magic Magazine to be able to say, you know what, I can do nonfiction and I think make it engaging also. And of course, the longtime support and prodding, hey, make a book, make a book, make a book, of the viewers up from the Star Wars Home Video Library right here on this YouTube channel. So now, it's done. It's out there. I hope you've enjoyed this rather long-winded rundown of how we got to this point, uh, where the book came in, and those pitfalls that I ran into in the process of getting all the formatting right so that maybe if you decide to self-publish something of your own at some point, hey, maybe you'll be able to avoid those pitfalls because you'll remember what you saw right here on the blog, The Voice of Reason or Lack Thereof. With that, we'll wrap up this episode of the vlog. Thank you all for watching. I um, hope you've enjoyed this look, as I said. And next vlog episode, we're looking at this as a potential product line. Is there going to be a second edition, third edition? What can we expect of it? Because Star Wars Home Video isn't stopping. It's still coming. At some point, will this have to catch up to where reality winds up being? We'll address that and ask for some of your opinions on the subject in the next episode of the vlog. Thanks.